So there's not a universal term or a universal definition for the English equivalent music. We really have to look at how do communities and different traditions actually define that term. Uh, I'll just give an example from my field work in southwestern Nepal <laughs> with um, the Taru community. So when I started doing field work there, I told people that I was looking at Taru Lokgit. And people were really confused. They were like, Taru Lokgit, Taru Lokgit Tata? Because in Nepal, there's a certain perception about what Lokgit should sound like. But when I started telling people that I was looking at Taru Loknats, Everyone understood what I was looking at because they were like, "Oh, taru lok nats, taru samodayama, koti ramri nats harutan." Right? Everyone knew what what I was looking at then. So that's just one example where there's not one particular term that we can use to encapsulate what we would call music um, in the West. So like there's no universal definition for music, there's no universal standard by which we can judge music. Uh, we have to look at each individual uh, tradition and see how they define something that's good or bad, right or wrong. Um, I'll give an example from the class that I teach in the United States, uh, so Intro to World Music. Most of the students that I work with are trained in the Western art music tradition, so they're used to what's called an equal-tempered scale. Some of the instruments I introduce are not tuned in that way. Um, and so when I introduce these instruments to them, they think something is wrong with the instruments. And I have to tell them, no, the instruments are tuned in the exact way that they need to be. It's just the sound is not what you're used to hearing. So there, in those communities, they, the instruments are tuned exactly the way they need to be uh, by the standards by which those communities think sounds good. Um, it's just not the same standard as my, that my students are used to. So again, going back to there's no universal definition of music, there's no universal standard by which we can judge music. Uh, what is um, more pleasing to someone's ears, a lot of it depends on what they grew up with or what they're used to, to hearing. Um, but something to also remember is that a lot of music traditions, especially folk music traditions, they're not meant to just be listened to, they're actually meant to be participated in. So, for example, a lot of the folk music that I studied in Taru communities, I wouldn't choose to listen to that music on my iPod as I walked to work or commuted to work. However, I have very fond memories of participating in that music during festivals like Magi, uh, watching those dances during Dasai. Um, in those cases, music, it's much more about participation and exchange between people, not being passively listened to. So that's just something we have to keep in mind uh, when it comes to, you know, is something pleasing to listen to? Not all music is meant to just be listened to, it's meant to be participated in. So this is where I'm going to get a little technical and talk briefly about scales. Scales are not necessarily based on acoustic principles or some kind of universal scientific base. Um, in the 19th century, there was a scholar, an Englishman, named Alexander Ellis, who actually physically measured several different scales and tuning systems from around the world, and he compared them. And he came to the conclusion that there's not necessarily a basic principle used to organize sound. People organize sound in ways that just sound pleasing to them. It might not be the same way that the West organizes sound, but that doesn't mean that there's not, it doesn't mean they're illogical, it doesn't mean they're capricious, it just means that there's a different standard by which people in other cultures organize sounds. He also made a really, um, I think, good observation about music in his own culture. So he came across a book that claims to teach children how to play music, but on further observation, he saw that it actually taught them how to play the piano. And so he made the observation that we tend to identify uh, you know, music with a particular instrument or with a particular musical tradition. So in the West case, equating music with the sound that comes from the piano. Um, which is very true still in, I mean, in all cultures, but just to use an example from the West, 
music departments in the United States, the music that they play is primarily the Western art tradition. So the sound is orchestral, symphonic, it's associated with solo virtuosic instruments like the piano or violin. Folk traditions, jazz traditions, contemporary popular music traditions are not necessarily associated with the term music within music departments. And so, again, there it's just like culture and context actually determine what we think of when we hear the term, the term music, and that shapes our perceptions about what is, what sound is musical. So in the West, we, um, our scale is what's called an equal tempered scale. So we've actually taken the octave and split it into 12 equal parts. Um, that scale was not always used, however. Uh, that scale came to be used more often or more frequently after the, re the European Renaissance in the 16th century. Before that, uh, Western music used something called the Just Tempered Scale, which was based on the overtone series. The problem with that, though, is once you moved out of different keys, so if you're moving from like, you know, G to A, the interval started to sound out of tune. Uh, because, like, for example, your G sharp and A flat, they're actually not the same pitch, even though on the modern scale they are. Um, and so that provided a problem when composers wanted to move between scales. Uh, they wanted to move, um, not stay in one scale, but move into, into others. And so that's where equal temperament gave them that ability, gave them that flexibility uh, that they wanted to compose more complex pieces, to have more, more harmonies. Equal temperament was not immediately accepted, however. Um, we equate the equal temperament with the piano today, but keyboard instruments were actually slow to take this, um, this scale up. That's why composer J.S. Bach actually wrote what's called the Well-Tempered Clavier. So it's a series of uh, 48 preludes and fugues written, fugues written in all 24 major and minor scales uh, because he wanted to demonstrate how you can compose in all of these scales and things still sound, sound really good. Um, we have to remember though that uh, equal temperament, it is a compromise and so if you're technically speaking, there are some intervals that are going to sound slightly out of tune, um, but again, it's a compromise that musicians and composers are willing to have so that in all, um, everything sounds good. However, um, when uh, for some pieces, so for example, if you're in a choir, um, and you're just singing for voices, um, there are some choir directors that will not tune their choir to an equal-tempered instrument. Um, they'll actually use a tuning fork, um, they'll you know, hit a note, and then from there they'll give their choir the, the notes that they need, and then they'll have them adjust their, their tuning as they move between, between pieces or between, between scales in, in a piece. Um, and there you do have a much more precise tuning. You don't have those same compromises that you would if you, you know, had to tune to an equal tempered instrument like the piano. So the harmonium came about in the middle of the 19th century uh, because, and it came about in con from continental Europe uh, because people were looking for an instrument that, um, a keyboard instrument that was, had the equal tempered scale that was more portable than the piano or the organ. Um, so pianos, they're rather large instruments, you can't exactly move them around. Organs are actually installed in a particular building or room, so you can't move them around either. So they needed something that was portable, that they could take to performances um, that could accompany, um, accompany singers or other instrumentalists. It actually became rather popular um, in South Asia, though, uh, because just the way the harmonium is built, um, it actually stands up to the climate a lot better. And so pianos would disintegrate in the heat, um, harmoniums were a little hardier. Um, and so even though in Western Europe, harmonium use actually died out um, kind of later in the 19th century, early in the 20th century, um, you had other instruments that um, took its place. It got its second birth in South Asia because it was adopted um, by a number of um, 
Indian classical musicians and you actually had instrument makers in India who modified the instrument to for um, for your South Asian audiences. So the European harmonium is actually uh, the pump is on the feet um, because again harmonium an instrumentalist needs all of their hands, all of 10 of their fingers to actually create harmonies. Whereas uh, with South Asian um, music, it's characterized as more melodic. So based on you know notes one after another, not notes played on top of one another. And so your harmonium instrumentalists in South Asia, they just needed one hand. And so that's why instrument makers modified the harmonium so that you had the hand pump. Um, and instrument makers sit on the floor as well, so they wouldn't wouldn't use their their feet. Um, so even though using the harmonium died out in continental Europe, uh, it actually became a much more popular instrument in South Asia and got its second birth there. Um, so there's actually three things that caused equal temperament to kind of go around the globe and become as prevalent as it is today. Uh, one was modern engineering. Um, even though the equal temperament and equal tempered scale was used prevalently in your late Baroque, early classical periods, it wasn't precise. Uh, with modern engineering, they were able to mathematically figure out what should be what should be the measurements of this scale um, or this way of tuning. The second was actually mass manufacturing. So you had the Industrial Revolution, they were able to mass produce instruments. Because they were able to mass produce these precisely tuned instruments, you had more uniformity. Um, it was all, these instruments were also more affordable uh, because you had a rising middle class, you had more demand for, for instruments like the piano. During the 19th century, that's when you actually see the piano showing up in a lot of middle class homes. So you have these mass-produced, more precisely tuned instruments, you have more uniformity. You also have, um, it's a lot easier to travel around the globe at that time, not as easy as it is today, uh, but again you have things like steamships and rail and things like that that made it easier to move these instruments around and so these were exported to, to other places and of course took the instrument, its tuning there as well. For South Asia, we often think about the harmonium as the primary keyboard instrument that brought equal temperament to this part of the world, but in other parts of the world it was actually the accordion, especially for like Eastern European folk music. Um, that instrument is now associated with those traditions, it wasn't originally there. Depending on who you talk to, um, some will say that introducing the accordion actually you know, provided more um, flexibility, provided new innovation, um, new you know, creative ways um, of creating music. Um, others will say that because it's the loudest instrument in the ensemble that other instruments were forced to tune themselves to the accordion and so that's why um, your Eastern folk music doesn't have the same uh, idiosyncrasies that it had previously. So depending on who you talk to and their perspective, they might say that introducing equal temperament and the accordion was a good thing. Others will say that um, it wasn't, wasn't a good innovation. So hopefully from what we've talked about, you can see that there's no universal definition of music, there's no universal way to judge music aesthetics. Um, and so in that case, the equal tempered scale, the harmonium, it's not necessary to make something musical. Um, one thing to keep in mind though is that all of these systems, including equal temperament, they do have limitations. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Good musicians, good composers will work within those limitations and creatively exploit them. Um, so for example, with the harmonium, yes, because it's equal tempered, it just has those 12 notes, it's not going to necessarily be able to do the same things that other instruments in your South Asian classical tradition are able to do, like it can't glide between notes, it can't produce those microtones, but good musicians will actually understand those limitations and work within them. And so for South Asian hum, harmonium players, some of them have reed banks that they will change out depending on what raga they're, they're playing in. 
They might also just say that, you know, there's just certain ragas that the harmonium is not good for, and so they're not going to play in those ragas. They might have certain techniques that they use to try and imitate glides um, to compensate for the limitations of that, that instrument. The equal tempered scale also has limitations for you know, Western music as well. I mean, not this isn't necessarily an equal tempered limitation, but all instruments, they have a certain octave range. So a good composer is not gonna compose something for an instrument that the instrument cannot physically produce. Um, so once we understand the limitations of those instruments and work within them and modify our expectations, um, then it's easier to actually kind of use and exploit creatively what the instrument or what the tuning system actually can do.